It's time for Voice of Indy. Your hosts today are Beam Weeks, author, producer, and marketing monster for independent multimedia publisher Fresh Ink Group, and Stephen Jeeves, author, producer, composer, and publisher for Fresh Ink Group. Greetings, everybody. Welcome to another Wednesday evening and another episode of the Voice of Indie podcast. This is show number 80. 80 of these things we've racked up. I am your host, Beam Weeks, and with me, as always, is Stephen G's. How are you doing tonight, Stephen? Uh, I'm doing nifty and fine. <clears throat> I'm trying to remember those 80 shows, and it's like, well, I remember about four or five of them. I don't know where 80 came from. <laughs> <clears throat> that was a whole bunch of them. In fact, I think I remember like four of them were Robert G. Willis Croft. <clears throat> it's uh, yeah. We're finally out of that cold snap. It's beautiful down here. We're going to be pushing 70 degrees and sunny all week long. Uh, the bluebirds are nesting in the bluebird houses out here in the yard already, and the, the bass are coming in and bedding. The crappie are starting to bite. It's getting to be springtime in Alabama. Wow. Well, we had we had 41 today, and that's, you know, last week at this time we were below zero, so that's a good thing. Yeah, it got it got unusually cold down here. I mean, we had three times we got dustings of snow, and that doesn't happen very often down here at all. But uh, I was talking to Dr. Helen Burrell, our author of American Agony today, and she's working with our marketing guy, Sam, on putting together an event. And she said that he had made some reference to some joke about being a teenager, and she thought that was funny. And I said, but he is a teenager. And she was shocked. She had no <laughs> idea. And she, it, it took me like three times to explain it. No, he's been with us almost a year and a half. I hired him right after he turned 16. He's 17 and a half now. You know, we wanted a, a young person who's out there working that social media, got his own yeah. massive following, an influencer and all that. And, and he impressed me more than anybody else. So, yeah, we've got a teenager. But it's <laughs> kind of funny because this cold snap, he's an Eagle Scout. Um, and he's working on like the last couple of badges that you can get so that he would have every badge an Eagle Scout can get. And one of them was he had to do a six day uh, hike and he went out to walls of Jericho here in Alabama and planned this hike. And his father wound up going with him basically to help be a pack mule. And that was the week that we got the cold snap. So he spent six days out there in like 20 degree nights with dustings of snow on him and he's not used to that so he had all kinds of fun stories about you know having to strip down and wade across rivers and 20 degree weather and all that and then and now now we're pushing 70 today so he picked the wrong week but uh <laughs> yeah sam sam's out there working on helping people plan events right now so if you're you're one of our authors and you're talking to sam yeah it's a bona fide teenager you're talking to but uh, he knows what he's doing yes he does now, uh, listeners, uh, an update on Robert G. Willis Croft's latest, uh, The Ort Federation. Uh, the book is literally any day now. And uh, the audio book we are currently working on, and we hope to have that done uh, in short time. But uh, the audio book takes a little longer because we work a little bit of magic back there. So uh, keep your ears open and uh Keep an eye on the newsletter because all this stuff will be in the newsletter when these are ready. So, yeah, it, now it is now. It is now because the print book's probably going in tonight, and then ebook okay. will be in the next couple of days. So, get out there and start looking. Get your order in. Now, uh, listeners, uh, every week we tell you this: we want you to call in with your questions or comments for tonight's guest. Uh, and if you can't call in, hit Twitter with the hashtag Fresh In Group in it, but here's uh, a little more on how you can participate in tonight's episode. Call 516-453-9902 right now and join us on air or tweet us with the hashtag Fresh Ink Group in the body and we'll read your comment or question live. That's 516-453-9902 or hashtag Fresh Ink Group. Stay on top of these podcasts and all things Fresh Ink Group with our weekly digital newsletter. New releases, videos, stories, excerpts, interviews, and more. Sign up now on the homepage of FreshInkGroup.com and be the one who knows what's what. What, what, what? What, what, what? what, what? Now, you, uh, you self-publishers out there probably want to be aware of the fact that Draft2 Digital has just bought Smashwords. Smashwords is disappearing. It's being folded in, and it's going to operate under the name Draft2 Digital. 
So if you have Smashwords accounts, you have books published through there, they should fold in seamlessly. Should, anyway. It doesn't always work out that way. And if you've already got a draft your digital account, it shouldn't affect you at all. So uh, Smashwords is going away. Yeah, I've seen them reading stuff on that uh, in the last day or two. Uh, and uh, author Jenny Wang, her audio book is uh, in being produced right now. I'm working on that. Uh, and as the voiceover artist gets me each file, I am taking care of those. So keep an ear out for Jenny Wang's audio book as well. And her website should be ready to go, uh, again, literally any day. Now, there are just a couple of little bugs that we have to take care of, but uh, it's uh, getting close. Getting close. Jenny Wang, author. If you miss a show, find us in the archives in the Fresh Ink Group channel on YouTube, on Spotify, or under the podcast tab at freshinkgroup.com, beamweeks.com, and stephengs.com. On YouTube, be sure to like and subscribe. All right. Check out scores of Fresh Ink Group book trailers in the Fresh Ink Group channel on YouTube. Be sure to like, subscribe, share, and spread the word. And just for the record, that's me playing the bass on that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> in next week's newsletter, we'll put a placard in there with a link to that playlist. <clears throat> if, if you go over to Fresh Ink Group channel on YouTube, you'll see everything we have in there. But if you click on the link to the playlist, then you can watch just our trailers. And there are probably close to 80 trailers now. That's several hours worth of of riveting, thrilling, cinematic amazement. I mean, it's just Hollywood uh, at its best. Oh, I'm telling you, you got to do it. <clears throat> now we've got uh, two more books that we're looking to have an out in a couple of weeks. A uh, how to start and run your own food truck business in Florida, and a book on training driving instructors to work to work in driving schools and things like that. So we're looking forward to that. And uh, keep an eye out for Pat- Patricia A. Guthrie's Eerie Charms. This is a couple of weeks away. Again, keep your eyes on the newsletter. You'll get the uh, notification about it. But uh, Eerie Charms is a stellar short story collection from a, a, a very talented writer, Patricia A. Guthrie. So uh, Eerie Charms, short stories, a couple of weeks. Check out FreshInkGroup.com for everything publishing. Meet scores of authors. Discover hundreds of great books, plus audiobooks, podcasts, videos, trailers, free stories, free manuscript evaluations, and more. That's FreshInkGroup.com. All right. So, time to introduce our guest tonight. A native of Green Pond, South Carolina, Abigail Hugeny spent two years at Colleton High School and was one of a dozen students who bravely integrated Walterboro High School in 1965. She earned her Bachelor of Arts and Master of Education degrees from South Carolina State University, certification in special education from Michigan State University, go Spartans, and the educational specialist degree from Citadel. She has served as the Director of Technology Center and Assistant Principal at Orangeburg Wilkinson High School. She has long distinguished herself for civic education and church involvement, earning recognition for her contribution. A passionate historian, Abigail believes in not only preserving history, but passing it on to the next generation. Abigail is married to Andrew Huguenin, Jr., President of Alabama A&M University. They have two adult children and three grandchildren. And welcome to the show, Abigail. We are so glad to have you here. Hi, Abigail. Hello. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure being on. Now, the Michigan State connection is near and dear to my heart. (laughs) I am a diehard Spartan fan. I live not too far from East Lansing, and uh, they lost in basketball the other day. Second, second oh. loss in a row, so I was kind of bummed. But, you know, they'll bounce back. Yes, they will. <laughs> so uh, tell us a little bit more about you've lived in so many different places. Uh, and uh, tell us a little bit more about your, your journey uh, 
through uh, all this this amazing education that you've received. Well, it has been a journey, and I have um, enjoyed every bit of it. I grew up, as you said, in Green Pond, South Carolina, so my formal education took place there. I also uh, went to um, Michigan and enjoyed being at Michigan State, but my husband was working on his uh, degree there. Uh, one thing that uh, we always joke about is why we were came back to South Carolina, and it was because of the snow, the snow of 1978. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that, but which I remember it, too. Was, <laughs> the cars were covered and everything was covered, and my husband looked at me and said, we will not be in Lansing next winter. So <laughs> we <laughs> enjoyed our time there. After we left Michigan, we came back to Orangeburg, South Carolina, and that's where we spent the majority of our time for almost 30-some years, and that's where our children were born. That's where they went to school. And Andrew and I enjoyed a long, stellar career um, at South Carolina State where he worked and in Orangeburg Consolidated District 5. Wow. And you, uh, you you live in Alabama now, correct? Oh, yes. I'm in Alabama now. We came in, to Alabama in 2009. Uh, Andrew was selected um, as the 11th president of Alabama A&M, and we right. have spent 12 and a half wonderful years at the university, and we have gotten to love the people here and also um, have grown found of Alabama. So we are, are delighted, however, that he has gotten the chance to um, retire on December 31st, and we are going to enjoy now our three grandchildren. And nice. do some traveling. We we love to travel, and we have uh, traveled um, 47 of the 50 states, and we plan to finish the other three, uh, one this year and two next year. So we will have travel all 50 states. What are the states you still need to hit? Uh, we have Oklahoma and North Dakota and South Dakota. Oh, well, those are the three hottest states in the country. It's all happening in Oklahoma. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so, well, congratulations yeah. to your husband on the grad on the uh, the uh, retirement. Yeah, I read about yeah. that in the newspaper, and it was citing uh, a long list of accomplishments that he's done over the years and at uh, Alabama A and M. A very impressive. Yes, we we he did um, a lot of work while he was here, and um, so we are very pleased with uh, all the accomplishments. Yeah. Now, before we run our first commercial, we do have a couple of comments on Twitter. Verwayne Greenhouse says, we had several nights of 22-24 as lows. We should only hit 33 tonight. Yee. But then he, yeah. adds, I, he added, I love my newsletter. So that's our that's our newsletter fan. <clears throat> and then he added, what time of year do you think is the best time to release a book? And, gee, I don't have an opinion on that when the book's ready. Yeah. You have an, you have an opinion, Beam? Uh, well, I guess that, you know, around the holidays leading into the Christmas holidays, uh, you know, somewhere around Thanksgiving is usually a good time, but I've never released a book at that time. Mine are usually in the late winter, early spring. So I don't know. Yeah. I know a lot of people who shoot for those pre-Christmas releases, but it's also when a whole lot of other people are releasing them too. So there's a lot of noise and a lot of competition. So probably why I haven't made that. Yes. As prolific as Verwayne is, I would say when the book's ready, get it out there. Yeah, because you got the rest also, of your life to promote it. Yeah, he also said, "Oh yes, I well remember the blizzard of '78. I was a paramedic in a rural area at the time." Verwayne is originally from the UP of Michigan. Uh, that's where he moved from there to Florida okay. to get away from the snow. Uh, and we had multiple calls down roads we couldn't even see. The county sheriff's department took us in on snowmobiles. I remember that I was in sixth grade and we uh, we were out of school for a while because of that. We had to walk <laughs> to the grocery store. And uh, Marlena yeah. Smith says, a fellow Bama writer. It's so nice to meet you, Abigail. So yeah, Marlena Marlene is in in thank Coleman, you. real Coleman, pretty area okay. around Coleman. Yes, right. Um, yes, I know exactly where Coleman is. So thank you yeah. so much. Yeah. 
That that blizzard of 78, I remember it very well, too. I was a sophomore in college, and I was driving a Chevette at the time, <laughs> you know, little little tiny car. And we had like uh, 15, 20 feet of snow, something like that. And when I say college student, I'm talking, you know, the other one, University of Michigan, the one in Ann Arbor. Go blue. Yeah. That, um, that, that. And, yeah. You know, and, and I have long said, hey, Michigan State's a good school. All my friends who couldn't get into Michigan went there. But um, <laughs> but at any rate, yeah, I, I went out with some friends. We were going to Lansing, oddly enough, to visit some some people that we knew. And we got about halfway there and wound up spending the night in a snow drift. But we were smart enough to take blankets and snacks and drinks and stuff like that. So we just made a night of it. Yeah, 78. Good times, Michigan. Now I'm in Alabama where we get ex- where we get excited and shut down the schools and close all the businesses because there's a dusting of snow coming. <laughs> You're right. <laughs> yeah. You're not used to the snow here. <laughs> so, Abigail, um, we're going to go ahead and do a, a, a first commercial here from somebody that you know, uh, B.A. Johnson. And then uh, we come back, we want to talk about your childhood and integrating Waterboro, Walter Barrow. Hi, I'm Mary Margaret Fanson. My grandmother, Big Mama, calls me Sassy. I've been a member of the African Methodist Episcopal Church all my life. I never knew why everyone was so proud to be AME. Then I meet Gerald in Children's Church. He thinks he knows everything about being AME. I told him a lot more just to show him. B.A. Johnson has written a book about me, my brother, and my friends with lots of colorful drawings. We also explore bullying, friendship, inclusion, death, grief, forgiveness, and more. Sassy discovers that AME Church is published by Fresh Ink Group in hardcover, softcover, and all ebook formats. Available worldwide. Come on, join me and discover why I can say I'm proud to be AME. All right. That's Barb B.A. Johnson's book. It's uh, apparently the first book that's been written for children about the AME Church, and it's doing very well. And uh, Barbara's out there working and holding events and also supporting her her uh, fellow Freshing Group authors. So we're, we're a fan of, of Barbara Johnson. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. Yes, and I just want to give a shout-out to Barbara. She's been one of my major cheerleaders. Um, and I, because of Barbara, I decided to write this book. This book has been sitting... Um, for about 12 years since we came to Alabama. And during COVID, um, I was going through some papers and trying to organize some things and saw where I had started this. And I said, well, God, it's time for me to get started. And with the help of um, uh, Barbara, we have uh, I'm now here. But um, this book really was a vision of mine, and I wanted to make sure it, it got in print. Um, because of the area of Green Pond where we grew up is so fascinating that it offers a lot of um, wildlife and uh, other things in the community. But when we were growing up, we lacked a lot of the resources um, that other areas had. So to see people from that area who were achieved so much really warms my heart. And so I wanted to put it in writing. As as Stephen said, I am a historian at heart. I am mm-hmm. not a writer of, of his, history, but I love the preservation of history. Well, it's a beautiful area to grow up. Uh, what kind of child were you? Were you into reading and write from a, writing from an early age, or is that something that came along a little bit later? What kind of interest did you have? How'd you spend your time? What was it like being a kid in Green Pond? Oh, it was fabulous. We we had a good time. We played uh, uh, various sports, softball, um, and various uh, other activities, but I did like reading, and that's when I formed a love for a couple things. A couple, uh, I always wanted to travel. And because of my reading, I knew there was another world other than Green Pond. So, therefore, my love of travel uh, was sparked then through reading because that's all we had. We had books. Um, I didn't know that there were other places that I could visit like um, South Africa and 
and China and Beijing, where the Olympics is, is being held now. But I have been able to go to all both of those places and more because of my love of reading. I also develop a love of travel, and um, so that's growing up on green, in Green Pond. We didn't consider boring because we always had something to do. No, we did not have the the big city life or what have you, but we made the best of what we had. Hmm. So you were involved in integrating Walterboro High School. That uh, that had to be challenging, scary, uh, but have major historical significance and maybe even be enough of a story there to get another book out of some time. But what, tell us about that. What was that like? What did you go through? Uh, well, uh, first of all, I'd like to give you an introduction to that. Um, I am the oldest of 11 children, um, a mother and, and father, Isaiah and Viola Hamilton. And my mother and dad said, well, if one of the children could go and sort of make it there, it would be Abigail. Uh, for two reasons, they felt that I could um, make it academically, I could compete, and my temperament was of such that I would not be getting in trouble every day. So mm. I was sort of selected to go, and I was the oldest of the group, so they, they, they said, you're going, you're going, we're going to try this, you're going to go. There were not many of us, and one of the persons who was with me was actually Kenneth Hodges' brother, William. He was one of the first uh, graduates as well. Um, hmm. So there were about maybe a dozen of us who, who went there. Uh, what was it like? Um, I was mainly in academic classes. Uh, so all of the teachers and the students in those classes were focused. So I didn't have a lot of problems. However, on the school bus, there were some difficulty. I never got in a confrontation, but some of the other students did. And at lunchtime, there were always bullies. Um, saying, you know, smart things, but we would sit and we wouldn't say anything. We would just um, or sort of mind our business, and 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 the principal was very uh, protective of us. That's the one thing I can say. His name was Mr. Wallace, and Mr. Wallace did not allow any foolishness on his campus. So we, um, it was not maybe a perfect situation, but it was not as hostile as some situations that um, I've read about. Well, you were pretty lucky then, because a lot of people did not have it nearly that easy. And uh, yeah. Wallace, Wallace is an ironically coincidental name, too. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, it is. But, uh, yes. So it, it now, was an experience, an experience that uh, I would probably would have, you know, I would do again, because, as I said before, it was not an overall um, fearful experience. It was fearful, but not something that I could not handle. Oh, good, good. Terrific. Uh, we do have another comment from Rowan Greenhoe. He says, it's great when writers help promote other writers. We all bring different genres to the table, and the audience is vast. That's true. It is a vast audience. Mm -hmm. I just uh, I can't always buy, find them, but they're, yeah, but they're out there. Um, Bean, will you say we've got a caller? You want to you want to run a commercial real quick and then take a call? Sure. Do you feel lost or broken? Are you trapped by fear, loneliness, and heartache, but unable to see a way out? Are you unhappy in your relationships and without a solution to make things right? I'm Vladimir Kalixi, a therapist in New York City who helps others all around the world to live in love from a place of emotional freedom. If you're searching for answers to all your struggles, my book, Naked and Transparent, Six Vital Tools for Knowing Yourself and Attracting Healthy Relationships can help you reclaim your life and attract more love, success, peace, and joy than you've ever imagined. Filled with personal experiences about love, loss, abandonment, Naked goes beyond a traditional self-help book, part workbook and part memoir, Naked is an enjoyable yet informative must-read for women, men, and teens who suffer from low self-esteem, feelings of unworthiness, anxiety, shame, guilt, failure, and toxic relationships. 
It is a refreshing, honest, and stimulating experience that will help you open your heart and soul and discover a brand new you. Naked and Transparent is available in hardcover, softcover, in all ebook editions from Kindle to Nook and Kobo and more. You too can grow personally, spiritually, emotionally, and professionally to redefine who you are from the inside out. Naked and Transparent, six vital tools for knowing yourself and attracting healthy relationships is proudly published by Fresh Ink Group. Very cool video for that over on YouTube in the Fresh Ink Group channel. Now, we do have two callers, so we're going to take the first caller first. Uh, this is going to be 256-527. Uh, Hello, caller. You are on the air. Where are you calling from, and what's your name? I am Thalia Love. I'm calling from Madison, Alabama. Hi, Thalia. Well, welcome, to the, welcome to the show, Thalia. Hello. Do you have a question or comment for uh, Abigail? No, I didn't have a, a question. I just logged in. So but uh, I, I just think it's interesting. I grew up in a in a small town as well and I just think it's interesting, you know, the similarities in the determination of the parents that the children do well and 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 show really what they're made of. Yeah. Regardless of their background. Are you from Alabama? Is this a small town in in Alabama? I'm originally from Mississippi. I'm originally from Indianola, Mississippi. Oh, okay. It's a pretty country around there. So have you seen this book? Have you seen There Must Be Something in the Water by Abigail? Uh, yes, I have. I'm and what do you think? <laughs> what do you think? Well, I haven't read it yet. I haven't, I haven't read it yet. I've just looked at the the topic and what it covers and and that's us thinking you know because we have a group of people as well from my hometown uh one of my uh friends family friends posted on facebook just the list of people who come from the mississippi delta which is pretty uh impoverished uh who have managed to succeed in spite of circumstances Hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah. maybe uh, maybe uh, the next book will be by you. <laughs> yeah, you know, Abigail's book is selling is selling very well. It's it's moving briskly, so it's a very popular topic. There's a lot of interest in it, and mm-hmm. and something that's inspirational to young people that you can never go wrong with that. Mm-hmm. Yes. Yeah. And um, I I also yeah definitely love for. Um, Dr. Love to um, do something like that because I think that recorded history is so important to leave for the next generation. Um, and, um, I, I, and she also referenced how the parents and the community sort of rally around us, and that was a lifesaver too. They protected us. They offered us what they could. And, and as a result of that, we were determined to make them proud of us. And I think that's the, the major was the major reason that so many of us succeeded. Now, this book only has 42 individuals, but I could have had 142 persons in this book because there are so many who have gone on from the small community to to just do wonderful things. But there was a volunteer basis to to be in the book. But I thank those who have um, submitted their biographies and all those who helps to make this book possible. And I just wanted to co- go back to something, um, Stephen, for a minute. You asked me about Walterboro High School and my integration there. But I can say my first teaching job was at Walterboro High School. All right. Um, wow. I worked there for three years. I taught um, English um, for the first year, and the second and third year I taught U.S. history and American government. So they decided enough of me to hire me <laughs> back wow, in high school where I graduated, and, I, and that was a very good experience. And I actually got a chance to teach my brother. He was in my American government class, and he is one oh. of the persons in the book uh, as well, Isaiah Hamilton. So, I, yeah, oh, Isaiah is your brother. Experience. Okay. Yes, yes, he is. Yes, see, I mm-hmm. did. I did as I was working on the book. I did not always know exactly what the connections were, who was related to whom, yes. how. So, uh, yeah, mm-hmm. 
Oh, that's cool. That's a very good experience. Mm-hmm. Well, thanks for calling in, Thalia. Um, be sure to help Abigail spread the word. Get it out there. And then uh, think seriously about that idea, maybe doing something with your people from Mississippi. I will. I will think about that. Yeah. Thanks, Dahlia. Yep. Mm-hmm. Okay, so now we're going to jump over to this other caller. Uh, this is going to be uh, 256. 256. Uh, welcome to yes. the show, caller. What's your name and where are you calling from? Hello? Hello, caller. Hello. Hello. That's, that's you. Hello, this is B.A. Johnson from Huntsville. Hi, B.A. <laughs> Hi, VA. <laughs> Hi, V.A. Um, How you hello, VA. <laughs> we kind of thought you'd call in. Oh, well, of course I was going to call in. Yes, I have <laughs> a question, to too, for Ms. Beginney. All right. Uh, and not only is uh, she uh, a good friend of mine, uh, she's also my church member. We are A&E. All right. So nice. we have that background as well. We are Amy. We're proud Amy. But I do have a question for Ms. Higini. I know she's been working very diligently on getting this book published. Uh, but being a first lady, she is the first lady or was until she retired, until her husband retired, she was the first lady of Alabama A&M University, which is a major university here in Huntsville. And she had a very busy schedule. So I wanted to ask her, just how did you find time to write your book with all your other commitments that you had? Yeah, I'm taking notes now. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I like that that uh, Nike commercial, Just Do It. I oh, always have had a busy schedule, but I literally do not think about things I have to do. I just do it. And so I have a schedule um, of whatever activities I have for the day, and I just go out and tackle them one by one. My schedule at Alabama A&M was busy, and, um, but I sort of carved that into my schedule of doing everything else in the community and whatever I had to do. And I enjoyed what I did at Alabama A&M because I felt what I was doing made an impact on the students there. And um, it was not um, something that I dread. I really loved it. And I was involved in all sorts of activities. Um, You know, we did Dancing with the President and the First Lady as our fundraiser. We have two major scholarships at the university, students who are coming um, who cannot maybe afford college. We have our our First Lady Endowed Scholarship as well as a Normalite Favors Scholarship to help students who may run out of money uh, before they graduate. Uh, But all of that was done um, in my love for students and my love for education, and that's just in my DNA. I just can't get it out. And if I had the, uh, (laughs) the, the, maybe the stamina, and physical strength to do it, I would go back in the classroom right now because I love teaching and I love trying to, you know, make sure that the future generation um, of students are prepared for the world. Hmm. So, yeah, and she was very always busy. busy. Yeah, yeah she, I, she, she keeps was always busy. busy. <laughs> and I love my church. I work, you know, in my church. I love my church members. And I want to... Um, just say how I, I just don't know how to say this. My our pastor, Reverend uh, Maurice Wright II, and our first lady, Reverend Joretha Wright, have been very supportive. I had my first book signing on Saturday, last Saturday, uh, February fifth, and the members just came, uh, just you know, to support this book signing and launch. And we had a wonderful time. We had fun doing it. And I say that I could not have chosen, uh, Andrew and I could not have chosen a better church family to be a part of other than the members of St. John A-M-E, AME in Huntsville, Alabama. <laughs> we are AMEs. <laughs> yes. Well, I have one more question. Mm-hmm. When, when are you going to start on the next one? <laughs> 
Well, I am thinking about another one. I uh, told uh, Stephen that I may do something a little more intimate about my family. My family history is very uh, unique um, in that there were um, 11 siblings. My mother and father did not, you know, graduate from high school, but they were determined to make sure that we all had an opportunity to go to college and, and do well. So I may do a more of an intimate story because there are some fun things as well as some, you know, serious things within our um, growing up experience that I will probably like to share uh, with everyone. Well, that would uh, that would be a wonderful book, and it would definitely be appreciated, especially, you know, long after we're gone, and then it's for posterity. <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> Maybe you want to look at Twitter? <laughs> Do what, uh, oh, at Twitter? Yeah, sure. Yeah. What do we got going on on Twitter here? Thank you for your questions and your answers. Thank you. Thank you, B.A. <laughs> You're welcome. Thanks, B. Barbara. Thanks. Thanks, Barbara. I love that. <laughs> All right. Bye, guys. Bye-bye. Okay. Over here on Twitter, we do have a couple of comments. Verwan Greenhall, he says, it's great when writers help from well, – okay, you already read that one, didn't you? Yeah. yeah. All right. Um Helen Burrell. Ooh, Helen Burrell. She's uh, always got something wonderful to say. She says, "Making it versus the hardest, li- hardest life struggles." An embracing subject of Abigail Huguenet's literary offering. There must be something in the water. Anthology of the fourth generation descendants of Green Pond after the eman- emancipation. She calls it uplifting. Fantastic. Mm-hmm. Thank you, Dr. Helen. And uh, Marlena Smith says, all these Alabama voices in those beautiful southern accents. <laughs> 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 and Verwain Greenhouse says, it's always nice to hear from VA. <laughs> you can tell who our regulars are, <laughs> our, our regular audience. All right. So, uh, so- I think we're up to about Orangeburg Wilkinson. What uh, you were assistant principal there and director of the technology center? Is that close to Green Pond, or have you ventured out away from the area by then? It's about an hour and ten minutes from Green Pond. It's about an hour and ten minutes. It's more centrally located. If you are in uh, South Carolina, it's about um, maybe thirty miles or forty miles east of Columbia, the capital. Um, so it was a very good location um, for us. And the reason why we uh, settled there is because um, Andrew was given his first job at South Carolina State after he completed his Ph.D. at Michigan State. And so it was a good, it's a good college town, a lot of, um, you know, cultural things that we could expose our children too, so it was a good experience for us. Yeah. Great. Um, so, so how about your personal time? How do you do? You have any hobbies or interests or things that you do just just to pass a little bit of time when you're not doing a hundred other things and getting a bunch of work done? <laughs> um, well, I love to travel. I love to uh, love to travel, as I said before, um, and I have traveled five of the seven continents, and and my plan is to uh, visit. Uh, my daughter and I are planning to go to Antarctica in the um, November, pray that that works out, and then uh, hopefully we can plan a trip to Australia. So I love to travel. That is my uh, one of my major things that I love to do. I also love to read. Um, I read uh, everything I can get my hands on. My husband said, if you don't want if if you don't want me to read it, don't put it down because I'm going to read it. I'm going to read anything. <laughs> um, I also like to cook. Um, I love to try out new recipes. And a lot of people think because I was a first lady of a university, I can't cook. But I think I'm a, a pretty good cook. <laughs> uh, and I, I I I like to try out different recipes. And I uh, love to volunteer. Um, that's the, the the things that that sort of I do it in my free time, but I I take care of myself. I do I do um, a lot of a, a lot of um, self care. 
I, I, I make sure that I take care of myself, whatever those little um, things are I like to do, like manicures and pedicures and massages and whatever. So I do take care of myself. <laughs> hmm. What's the best place you've traveled? What's that one place you'd like to go back to at least one more time? Oh, my. Go, <laughs> Stephen, you asked that question. Ah. Um, wow, wow. I would like to um, go back to, I think, South Africa again. We, I spent a week there. Um, I was able to go to Robben Island where Nelson ben- Mandela was in prison for 27 years. Um, it, it's just a beautiful part of the world that I, I, I think that I would, maybe not South Africa, but any parts of Africa I would like to go back. I was seeing pictures, but I would like to have the experience myself. Uh, one of my friends um, really challenged me to go in, on a safari. Um, and believe it or not, when I was in college, that was one of the first things that I said I would, places that I would go. I wanted to go in a so you know there are beautiful places. I've been on the Amazon River. I have climbed the Great Wall in China. Just so many amazing places that I've visited. So I can travel and go back to those places again. But I think I, I want to experience Africa a little more uh, because I think the continent has so much to offer. Yeah, it, it, I can only imagine. Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, yeah. You've seen the world. That's that's fascinating. I on places that I want to go. <laughs> Although Antarctica, <laughs> I hear that's colder than Michigan. <laughs> <laughs> it is. It is. I didn't know that I was think possible. It really is. But we are trying to take a short trip. Uh, what we're going to do? We are. I'm going to take a short trip just to, for the experience. Um, so we will not be out in the cold too long on uh, any one given day. Um, so well, that's we a good thing. decided just to do yeah. that. Mm-hmm. And, you know, with and all my that daughter traveling. Is the only per- the, well, my daughter is the only person who would go with me because, you know, that's why we left Michigan in 1978. My <laughs> husband does not like cold weather, so he was not going to I don't blame me. him. <laughs> Well, with all with all that traveling, it's it's nice, uh, you know, like when you're trying to get out of Green Pond at some point because you were growing up and wanted wanted to move on and get out and see the world. But to be able to go back to Green Pond and have such a beautiful place that's home to go back to, and now oh, yeah. where you are in the Huntsville, Alabama area, out there in Madison County, it's just spectacular. Everywhere you go, there's lakes, there's waters, there's streams, there's mountains yeah. all around you. Mm-hmm. And and see, I live down in the valley, right at the edge of the lake, so you can't go anywhere without driving over a mountain. And when you do, it's beautiful scenery, just beautiful. It is. Oh, yes, it's beautiful. It's beautiful. And I have had the opportunity to actually drive on the Tennessee River, drive a boat on the Tennessee River. So I love that. That's another thing that I love to do as well. Um, I am supposed to have gotten a boat for my retirement, but I don't see it in the, in the making right now. <laughs> mm. <laughs> At least Andrew has not said anything about it. <laughs> but anyway, I I, I enjoy it. <laughs> well, we're up to the part of our, our questions now where we want to get into the book in more detail, but we've got a commercial okay. to play for the book, and then we've got a caller, too. So let's go ahead and play the commercial, and then we'll take the call and uh, talk a little bit more detail about this great book. Okay. rural community in the low country along Ocean Highway, Green Pine, South Carolina, has long lacked cultural and educational opportunities for its young people's future success. Many have gone on to serve in the highest levels of education, government, public service, elected office, business, and medicine. With so much success against the odds, surely there must be something in the water. Abigail Hugini chronicles the impact just 42 of Green Pond's children have gone on to make in the world. All full-color editions include photos from around town and local translations of down-home fame. These inspirational stories prove that, regardless of one's background, we can all find our own path toward greatness. An excellent reference, keepsake, gift, and addition to every library. There must be something in the water, anthology of the fourth generation, descendants of Green Pond, after the emancipation 
is proudly published by Fresh Ink Group. It's a beautiful video over on YouTube that goes along with that commercial. The video is primarily featuring photos by a Reverend Kenneth Hodges taken all around Green Pond. So you can actually yeah. see see what she's writing about in the places that these people lived. Yeah. All right, let's go ahead and take this caller. Uh, hello, caller, you are on the air. What's your name and where are you calling from? <coughs> hello, caller. I'm hearing I'm hearing a sound effect for a Willis Croft audio book about a submarine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this, well, this one's not going to work. So maybe the caller yeah. can try calling back. Yeah. Okay. Well. Um, uh, yeah, we that's kind of talk strange. To, yeah. All right. So. Uh, <laughs> Hey, Abigail, the book. Tell us, tell us a little bit more about it. Uh, I, I just mentioned that many of the photos in there were taken by Reverend Hodges, and uh, could you talk about him and the pictures and some of the other stuff that's in the book? Yes, um, those uh, uh, biographies are in the book, but we also have what we call some down home sayings um, in the book as well to give you a, a flair for the Low Country and and some of the dialect. And someone mentioned that a few minutes ago. There is a certain dialect. Uh, from the low country, and one of the uh, things that we language, the Gullah language, is, um, it, is it is a language um, of that area. And for those persons who want to know more about it, they can always um, Google that as well. Um, yeah, there were several uh, pictures taken by Reverend Hodges in this book, and as well as Cleveland Frazier, who also took some of the pictures as well. And we have to um, give credit to se- several of the persons who helped um, put all these um, biographies together. Um, uh, Patrice Gerardo, Walter Fields, uh, Melissa Gary, David Hopkins, uh, Cleveland Frazier, Onita Snipe, um, Janae McDonald, who was the uh, proofreader, and Kenneth Hodges. And I, I have to give a shout-out to my husband as well, Andrew. Um he well, also wrote there, wrote the forward, right? Yes, he also wrote, wrote the forward. He certainly did. He wrote the forward in the book, um, and I appreciate him um, doing that for me. Um, there are several, uh, as you said before, sayings in the book um, that um, let's, every shut eye ain't sleep, every goodbye ain't gone, and that basically means be careful just because a person may appear to not be listening they very well may be hearing every word that you're saying. Uh, hmm. That's just one of them. And and it also features one of the things I wanted to mention, uh, uh, at one point, Green Pond was a major um, train station. There was a train station there, so anyone going north-south could stop and get a train out of Green Pond. But, uh, but that train station is no longer there. That's why it featured the tracks in the book, because that was a major source of transportation ah, that, okay. we, um, that we used to ride during that period of time. So you could uh-huh. just get buy your ticket as you climb on the train and to go north-south and, at that time. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And there, I wanted to mention, too, that some of the buildings featured in the book are still there. Uh, Green Pond really has not grown very much. We do not have a traffic light there. Uh, we did not have one wow. when we were growing up in Green Pond, and we still do not have one. And uh, But there are, are some unique features in the the area. Uh, the reason why the book is entitled There Must Be Something in the Water, because we are only like 30 miles from the Atlantic Ocean, and, and we um, – uh, that was a major source, another source of – um, income for people in the area. They would um, do uh, fishing, uh, and it still is for many of the persons there. And that's where Reverend um, Hodges grew up in that area called uh, Venice Point, and um, and it has a lot of rivers and and swamps and things like that. 
And as a matter of fact, the first school that we attended, which was a two-room school building, actually was near a swamp. So we would sometimes go for recess and wade in the water uh, as a part of our recreation while we were in school. Yeah, so um, the pictures in the book, um, as I said before, were taken by um, Cleveland Frazier and Reverend Hodges, some of them, and I would just like to give him a big um, thank you and shout out because on Saturday, I'm actually, he's hosting me for a book signing in Beaufort, South Carolina at his museum. So I would just like to just thank him so much for that. He actually called me and said, this is what I want to do. And I, I was very delighted and, and um, traveling this weekend to, for that book signing. Now, the poster for that event is in today's newsletter, so if any of you are going to be near South Carolina, check that out. Uh, I think that would be a lot of fun. And then uh, yeah. then you can spend the day driving around, see the area, see the low country. See the area, yeah. Yeah, I would now, love to do that. Mm-hmm. Now, yeah, Abigail. If you have not, oh, I'm go ahead. Go ahead. If you have not vac- uh, vacation in that low country area, I, I really – you, oh, you have? Okay, great. No, I haven't. Wonderful. Oh, you haven't? You haven't? No. Well, please, make that, put that on your bucket list of things to do. I am telling you there are a lot of features there, Charleston, Buford, Hilton Head, Green Pond. Um, there's a, they're a very interesting um, part of the country, in, uh, in the low country. Okay, uh, I see our caller is back trying it again. You guys want to try that? See if the caller mm-hmm. can make it this time. Let's go. All right. Hello, my oh. name is Amir. I'm calling from Georgia. Grandma, me, I'm proud of you. Oh. 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 <laughs> there I'm you go. That's our our youngest caller. I think so. <laughs> you know, Sounds like your grand, grand there. I have three lovely grandchildren. Uh, Amir is the oldest. He's eight. Nyla is five, and Kellel is one. Uh, those, those are, are all got our hearts. We, we are, love them so much, and they are smart and very talented uh, grandchildren. And you know I have to say that. <laughs> and Nyla's the one we have on the phone right now? Yeah, that, yeah that's a mayor. <laughs> it's a mayor. Uh, well, well, welcome is, to the show, mayor. Yeah, what's the best thing about your grandmother? I don't think Kellen are. Is she still there? Or is it's it still, the the numbers is, still up? Okay. That's my grandmommy. It, it, my grandmommy is the greatest. I, we give her. We give this gifts for being the greatest grandparents in the world. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. Yeah. Me, yeah, we gave. Uh, I gave her. I gave her a uh, a frying pan. I, I mean, uh, like one of us did get a um, a baking. Oh yeah, pan. a baking pan, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, definitely our youngest caller ever. Uh-huh. <laughs> well, thanks yeah, for calling in. Out. Thanks for calling in, Amir. Yeah, you should definitely be proud of your grandmother. <laughs> yeah, um, that uh, that beats out uh, uh, Ellie Collins. I think Ellie was probably the youngest prior to that. Yeah. Although she wasn't just a caller. She was a guest. Uh, oh, yeah. okay. Very good. Uh, so you want to roll another commercial beam? Uh, sure thing. As the Oort Federation becomes a major force in the solar system, Braxton Thorpe passes the Federation chairmanship to former U.S. President John Butler. Thorpe's group offers humanity virtual immortality, but Isidore Orloff and his Udachni Enterprises oppose their every move. While terraforming Mars for more living space, the Mars Reds prove formidable as resistors. If the Asterian Starship fighter pilots are released, Will they align with Phoenix or Udachni? And who will develop the right FTL technology? In this tense space adventure, Thorpe, 
his team, and Max the tabby cat. Travel to Proxima Centauri and beyond to the Aster system, 84 light years distant. Will Thorpe bring together humans and Asterians in their quest for intergalactic travel? Will long life prove more than mere humans can handle? Grab Icicle, a tensor matrix, the first Oort Chronicle, and continue the journey with the Oort Federation to the stars. Proudly published in all print, digital, and sensory enhanced audiobook by Fresh Ink Group. In 1945, 10-year-old Ronald Dennison, the son of a backwoods Arkansas preacher, began having profound dreams about religion and a strange red-haired woman. The dreams follow him for decades, with the woman sometimes seducing him, other times calling him to become a televangelist, but eventually berating him for his sins of lust. She holds a secret so dark that he dares never admit it, even to himself. The more famous and wealthier he becomes, the more he struggles with his adultery, his fetish, and his shame, until his torment can no longer be contained. Staggering revelations challenge everything he ever believed. Will truth bring him the peace he always craved? Or will the woman's demands prove more than he can bear? Read the novel The Calling Dream by Carlisle Toms. Proudly published by Fresh Ink Group in hardcover, softcover, and all ebook formats. The Calling Dream by Carlisle Toms. Right. The video the video for that commercial is not made yet. We've started it. We've got some animation and dropped in some elements, but it's going to be another week or two on that one. But uh, that one might actually, I think the Ort Federation will be out first in the next day or so, and then that one might actually be next. It's just uh, kind of hard to predict these things, but we're looking speaking forward to of, the calling dream. Yeah, speaking of the Ort Federation, that commercial, we actually have a newer updated one uh, that I was supposed to upload into uh, the Blog Talk Radio site, but I saw the old one was still sitting in there, and it kind of played a trick in my mind that, oh, it's already been uploaded. <laughs> so I need to switch that up, but we have a really cool one. Uh, it's, a, it's a little more uh, up, up-tempo than the one we just played so now speaking of published by fresh ink group uh abigail your book is published by fresh ink group uh what has your experience been working with uh Stephen g's and uh the crew at fresh ink group and i'm taking notes again wonderful wonderful um uh, again um b.a johnson gave me this company and uh, this publisher and i have had a very good experience everyone I've been, I just sent an email within a few minutes. I've gotten a response. Um, so I really have enjoyed working, and if I want to uh, write another book, I will definitely use uh, Fresh Ink. And anyone out there, if you're looking for a good publisher, easy to work with, and also uh, give you a good uh, – um, they're also very, I consider, reasonable as far as publishing is concerned. And I just want to thank Stephen and Beam again for this interview. This is an excellent timing for this book because it's a good reference in, as we enter Black History Month. Yeah, and, um, I thought about so that this afternoon. That, that, mm-hmm. Yes, yeah, so role models can be right in your community. Um, so um, you don't have to look for them on TV or other places, although we have them, wonderful role models. This is an excellent source. If you want to go into engineering, um, the military, or some other, we have a, a, a someone who represents all those areas and uh, on in this book. So I really appreciate the time that you've taken to give me an opportunity to um, talk more about the book and be a part of this podcast. Now, we have another timing coincidence, too. Normally, in the early part of this show, I... I've gotten in the habit lately of telling what our best-selling print books are so far that week. And I haven't announced that yet today, but uh, when I checked this afternoon, I noticed that our number one best-selling print book for the week is something called There Must Be Something in the Water. 
hardcover <laughs> edition and our number two bestseller for the week. And this we're talking out of all 200 and something titles that we have out there. Our number two bestseller is called There Must Be Something in the Water, soft cover edition. <laughs> So you landed in the number one and two bestseller spots for Fresh Ink Group this week, and we couldn't have timed that any better either. Congratulations. Yes, no, thank you. Thank you so much. And, you know, the real, standout, the real standout here, thank too, is that Thank you for all the supporters and people who are buying the book as well. Thank yeah. you so much. That mm-hmm. It's amazing to me, too, that it's so many hardcovers are selling uh, that well, because mm-hmm. usually hardcovers are a small percentage of sales. And uh, this one's going like gangbusters. So congratulations. Thank you. Thank yeah. you so much. Now I have a uh, a quick question here on uh, on the book, and in particular, the stories in there. Uh, all of these these individuals accomplishing great things. Did they all move away from Green Pond, or do they? Do some of them still live there? And if they did move away, like you live in Alabama. How often do you get back to Green Pond to visit? Okay. Uh, you know, that's a good question. That's a very good question. A lot of them are still in Green Pond. Quite All a right. few of them are. Um, the Joseph Hamilton, Oglesa Flood, um, Brenda Perkins, um, Timothy Hamilton, Eric Hamilton, uh, Pat- 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 um, excuse me, Patricia Simmons, Stanley Simmons. Some of um, Stanley moved away, but he came back, and that's that's one thing about Green Pond. Once you you <laughs> you don't want to ever leave. Um, so we go back. Andrew and I go back for very often. We get back about maybe four times a year, and oh, okay. um, to cause we still have fam- we still have family there. Quite a few family members. One of the of uh, the oldest person who is ninety ninety two years old. Uh, was one of our person who gave us some information for the book, um, Lanita Gary. So, yes, we have family there, and we get back uh, quite often. Yes. Okay. Yes, now, we do have... a, lot of them still, a lot of them still live there, yes. Well, we do have some comments on Twitter. Marlena Smith says, you've had such an incredible life, Abigail. You mentioned wanting to write a book about your family. What about your travels? Have you thought about sharing more on your adventures? Oh, yes, but that's a great idea, and i that's wonderful. Um, I do document my travels and, uh, and places I've been, and, yes, that's a great idea. I could probably great. consider that. Sounds mm-hmm. like uh, Marlena might get her name in the acknowledgements for helping inspire right, the idea. Yes, Marlena <laughs> just, sent, just sent it to, to Stephen, and I will definitely – Put it in there. <laughs> yeah, we we also have a question from Robert G. Willis Croft, uh, our our premier science fiction and Cold War submarine adventure thriller author here at Fresh Ink Group. He says, for a black young man or woman growing up in a typical black centric neighborhood, would you recommend trying for a mainstream college or a traditionally black college? Oh well, it, it depends. I in my family, I have had um, persons who. Um, have gone to um, uh, HBCUs, uh, historically black colleges and universities, and um, as as majority universities, like some of my cousin David Hopkins and some his sisters went to University of South Carolina, and they did extremely well. But uh, how I tell parents to look for a college, you need to visit and find the best fit for your child. There are some children who fit better in uh, HBCU um, versus the majority, and there are some that can go right there. My sister uh, graduated from Clemson University, um, and I have you know others who have gone on to do well at those universities. But I always tell parents to all make sure that you do a college visit and also talk to the people, talk to the students who are there to find out whether that um, university is a good fit for you. Mm, that's good advice for uh, all races, all mm-hmm. ethnic groups. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yes. Mm-hmm. Uh, and for yeah. Wayne Greenhouse, says congratulations, Abigail. Uh, sounds like you've got a new fan, Abby. Okay, <laughs> thank you. So, do you have any advice for authors out there? Uh, if you have an idea, go for it. Because as a uh, uh, Stephen and Dean will tell you we still do not have enough books 
publish on maybe uh, localized history. So if you have something to share, share it. Um, and it, it takes a while. You know, I'm not going to tell you it's easy because, you know, in doing a book like this, you have to do research, you have to make phone calls uh, and, and, and things like that. But if you have an idea and you're passionate about it, write it. Um, you will find the Fresh Ink um, publishers easy to work with, and they'll tell you if something is not um, right. They'll give you some advice. They'll spend the time needed to get you through the process. Hmm. Yeah, well said. Um, yeah. How can how can uh, readers find you? Uh, can they find you on social media? Do you have a blog, website, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter? Um, yes, I have a website, and um, it's um, www.spoiledandreturned.com forward slash, I mean, um, backslash books. Um, that's the, the first one. I also can be contacted to email abbyguinea at gmail.com. And I do have a Facebook page on Spoil and Return and my regular Facebook page. Okay, Great. now as also, usual, as always, as you can you, contact us. Yeah, we have a contact form on the website. If you have a, listeners, if you have a question, you, uh, you can use the contact form and we'll make sure Abigail gets that. Mm-hmm. So, Abigail, yeah. it has been. Very fun having you on. I've been looking forward to this for a long time, and and I know uh, some of our fans out there have have expressed interest. Uh, B. A. Johnson couldn't wait; she was excited. <laughs> um, <laughs> and uh, yeah, yeah, it's 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 been fun hearing about the the Low Country and and what it was like growing up there. And you've produced a terrific book, and it's not just your grandchildren who are proud of you. We're all proud of you, and uh, we think this Indeed. is something for posterity, and that. That we need to see more of this kind of stuff happening. And, and I was serious when I said maybe Thalia needs to think about doing something like that with Mississippi yeah. as well, because mm-hmm. inspiration mm-hmm. is not something that you can ever have too much of. And yeah. Uh, yeah. setting setting role <laughs> models and examples for young people, um, especially if they're you know facing some extra challenges from their circumstances or whatever, mm-hmm. then yeah, this this is good stuff. So we're we're very proud, Abigail. We're thrilled to have you on, and we're looking forward to. Uh, helping promote more events for you in the time to come. We certainly hope you get a good crowd this weekend uh, at the yeah. museum. Yes. I will, I will let you know. All right. And so, so, pictures. so Beam, who have we got next week? Uh, next week we have Carlisle Toms. Uh, you heard the uh, commercial for his The Calling Dream. So uh, tune in for that. He's a return uh, guest. He's been on before, so don't yep, miss that one. And then we have singer-songwriter Frankie Ray is going to be on the weekend after that. Some friends of mine in Tampa, Florida, went and saw her this week and said she puts on a terrific show. And uh, she's cool. even got some coasters that she hands out to people that are in the shape of feet and say Frankie Ray on them. So, uh, <laughs> gee, you know you've made it when you've got foot coasters. And uh, who's after Frankie Ray? After that, we have A.K. Alice. Good idea. He's from Australia. He'll be calling in from... Uh, I believe it's Perth, uh, so uh, it'll be early in the morning the next day when we talk to him on Wednesday evening. Um, it should be a good time. Uh, he's an author, uh, writes some pretty good stuff, so tune in for that. And then after that, after that March, March 23rd, we're going to have crossover shows. We're going to have me as the guest on the video podcast that's put out by Ron and Joan Carter. Uh, thriller authors who've, who've written quite a few good books. And then as the second that ends, literally the second that ends, we're clicking over and to this podcast and they are going to be the guests on our show. So we're all getting all up in each other on uh, March 23rd and I can't be more excited about it. So we're looking forward to seeing you then. So yeah, on our way out, we're gonna, we are going to play one more commercial like we did last week. Abigail, again, thanks for coming. It's been a hoot. Thank, thank you, you so much, and, and thank all the listeners as well. Thank you. Yep. All right. We'll see everybody next time.
Refreshing Group presents Slivers of Life by Beam Weeks, a collection of short stories. A girl's hunger won't wait. A woman scorned takes matters into her own hands. Seeking peace by any means necessary. We pay attention when big events happen all at once, but everyday life comes at us in slivers. Two boys, a girl, and secrets in the woods. Young love falls short of the dream when the monster is someone we know. Secrets from the past mirror the tragedies of today and a young man searches for his lost faith. Slivers of Life, a collection of short stories by Beam Weeks. Read Slivers of Life in print or ebook editions, including iBook, Kindle, Nook, and more. Slivers of Life is proudly published by Fresh Ink Group. You've been a part of Voice of Indy, a production of Fresh Ink Group. Spread the word, support our guests, then find us at freshinkgroup.com and be sure to hashtag Fresh Ink Group.